All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Thanks to Anna for setting the stage. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about a phenomenon that was recently discovered in astronomy, which is called fast radio bursts. I'm going to explain what they are, view the results that we've achieved here in the Netherlands. This uh, title graph actually shows you real data. This is an actual fast radio burst. Uh, this is the actual galaxy that it comes from, an uh, uh, image made with the Gemini telescope. And these are some of the telescopes that were involved in, in figuring out where it came from on the sky and, uh, and determining how far away it was, including one of the dishes of the, the Westerbork telescope here. This is obviously an artist's conception, but you know there's some real data shown in it as well. So about 15 years ago, one of my colleagues, Doug Lorimer, he was in Australia with one of his undergraduate students. And they were looking for young pulsars, and they were looking towards what are called Magellanic clouds. These are galaxies that orbit the Milky Way, and they were looking to see, you know, can we find some, some young pulsars that people have not seen before in this, in this direction. And they pointed the Parkes Radio Telescope, which is in this movie, The Dish, which is another great astronomy movie. It's about um, detecting um, the signals or the broadcasts from uh, the first moon landing in the late 1960s. This is a, a drawing of the Parkes Telescope. This is obviously also a, an artist's conception. And they were looking for young pulsars, and um, the techniques that they were using were also sensitive to, to detecting other types of astrophysical signals. And what they found was not a young pulsar. They found something that is, in many ways, far more spectacular than, than a young pulsar. A pulsar being a neutron star that produces radio flashes. Okay? So they detected this thing that we now call the Lorimer burst. And what was the Lorimer burst? I'm going to show you actually uh, a scientific diagram because Anna set the stage for that. I feel comfortable doing this. I'm going to try not to trip over this cord as well. Um, this is what the signal looked like. Maybe it doesn't look as impressive as the artist's conception that you just saw, but essentially it's just a short flash of radio light, so radio waves coming from outer space, lasting for only a few milliseconds, which is much shorter than the blink of an eye. Uh, this is what that, uh, that, that blip looked like as a function of time. And what they saw was the, that this blip of radio waves it arrived at the highest radio frequencies uh, first and arrived later at lower radio frequencies. So basically different you know, wavelengths of radio light it arrived first at the, the shortest wavelengths and later at the, the longer wavelengths. This is something that happens with all kinds of astrophysical um, radio signals. And it has to do with the fact that when, when radio waves are traveling through uh, space, through our galaxy and between galaxies, they get delayed by the fact that there's all kinds of gas ionizing material between stars, between galaxies. And really, the speed of light, you think of the speed of light as something that is, is absolute and has a certain value, but the speed of light is, uh, depends on the, the wavelength of the, the radio waves if it's traveling not through a vacuum, but traveling through you know, not completely empty space. So that's what causes this delay. And to a certain degree, it allows us to figure out how much material the signal traveled through. And what they were surprised about was, you know, if, if the signal would have come from the other side of our galaxy, the other side of the Milky Way, it would have been delayed by about this much. And yet, they saw that it was delayed by about 10 times more. So what Duncan, a student, had discovered, actually, was the signal was not coming from our own galaxy. It was coming from much further away. And they estimated that it was coming from billions of light years away. So pulsars, which are, again, these neutron stars that produce radio flashes, they're pretty amazing objects, and I've studied them for a large fraction of my life, actually. Um, but these things are coming from millions, if not billions of times further away, and must be much, much brighter. And we call these things fast radio bursts now. And the fact that these radio flashes are so bright and come from so far away has really captured, I think, the, the public's imagination. Uh, here are some examples. You know, if you go on Spotify and you look up Lorimer Burst, you'll find this, this band that's called Lorimer Burst. There's uh, an album that's called FRB. Um, I don't know, what does it say? Rock That Thirst Fast Radio Burst. I have no idea what this <laughs> mean. Uh, this is a graph that I actually made for one of our papers. It ended up on the cover of an album, and I got no money for it, but I think the album was, uh, I think the album was really unsuccessful, so... <laughs> uh, and here are some shocking facts about this phenomenon. Okay, so Baby Yoda is impressed as well. Um, so they last about 100 times shorter than the blink of an eye, so just for a few milliseconds. If you blink your eyes right now, 
that will take about 200 milliseconds, and these last for only about a couple milliseconds. So they're really, really short. You can only detect them, you know, using computer recording software. You know, if you had radio eyes, you wouldn't be able to see this. They we now know that they come from galaxies far, far away, and hence they were created long, long ago. And one of these radio flashes is emitting as much energy as the sun produces in an entire day. So the sun is pumping out energy for an entire day. Within a millisecond, this one flash of radio waves contains just as much energy. So they're really, really luminous. And you might think, well, okay, that sounds very exotic. Presumably these things happen very infrequently. But the funny thing is, they don't. They're super, uh, they're ubiquitous. We see them across the sky. We know that once every 10 seconds is one of these radio flashes occurring somewhere on the sky. So I've been talking for, I don't know, a few minutes or so. So dozens of these radio bursts have hit the Earth within the time that I've been speaking. And they're coming from all over the sky. If you had giant radio eyes, it would be like looking at a fireworks display going on uh, across the sky. And again, they're coming from really far away. Um, so this is an example of one source that we know comes from about 500 million uh, light years away. And if you think about the scale of these things, you know, this radio flash Again, it lasts for a fraction of the blink of an eye, but it's traveling over hundreds of millions, if not billions of light years through intergalactic space from other galaxies towards the Earth. And think about the scale of things here. You know, it's gone within, you know, much less than the blink of an eye, but this signal, it originated 500 million light years from Earth. Within 500 million years, you know, life crawled out of the oceans, it got onto land, it evolved, uh, we had apes, we had humans, humans developed technology, they built a radio telescope, they pointed it in this direction of the sky, and just in time, bam, up on the radio. <laughs> We've got to publish a paper or get a thesis. That's great. So, what are these things? We don't know what they're coming from. One of the options is they're, that they're coming from uh, neutron stars. Some of these models are more plausible than others, obviously. Hopefully that goes with that saying. Um, one of the options for what is producing these radio bursts uh, is magnetars. Magnetars is something that Anna knows way more about than I do, but she didn't talk about it because she was just flexing about talking about something else instead, apparently. <laughs> but magnetars are neutron stars that have such enormous magnetic fields that most of the energy from the neutron star is coming from the fact that the magnetic field is decaying with time. So they're like giant magnets, essentially. We'd almost think of them as spinning balls of magnetic field as opposed to as opposed to neutron stars. So one of the options for, for the fast radio bursts is that they're coming from these magnetars, but there are various other models, some of which are very, very uh, exotic, including even evaporating black holes, for instance. And one of the reasons that these, these signals are so interesting is not just because they pose this really compelling astrophysical puzzle, you know, who, who is producing or what is producing these, these incredibly luminous radio bursts, they're, they're actually really, really useful tools for studying the universe as well. So it's almost like you know, someone standing at distances of hundreds of millions of light years, if not billions of light years away, and they're, you know, they're, they're flicking a, a laser pointer kind of like this from very far in, in deep extragalactic space. And we can see what happens to that, that radio uh, light, or that, well, let's call it the laser beam, as it's passing through all of the gas between stars, between galaxies, within the, our Milky Way and within the other galaxies. And it provides us a way of basically mapping all of the otherwise invisible gaps between stars and galaxies. It allows us to see the universe that would otherwise be invisible to us, because essentially it's like someone's flashing a laser beam from, uh, from very, very far away. So this is one of the reasons we're really interested in studying this phenomenon, is because it's a, a very useful tool for studying the universe. And, you know, 15 years ago this Laurel reverse was discovered. And uh, you know, at the time there was just one example of this phenomenon because our technology had not matured to the point where we could uh, you know, detect a lot of these signals. But astronomers uh, got really, really excited about this phenomenon. I remember this happened around the time I was finishing my PhD and I also got quite excited. Um, and astronomers started to build telescopes that are much better suited to detecting these types of signals because in science, you know, once you know that there is a phenomenon out there, uh, that is interesting to study, you can start building instruments that are better tuned towards studying that phenomenon. Even though you discover it serendipitously, you know, kind of, you know, you stumble across it in the middle of the night, and you think, oh, I didn't realize that existed. Then you can build an instrument that is tuned towards studying the phenomenon. 
And in the last five to ten years, a whole host of new radio telescopes, I think very few of which were shown in the quiz, well, this unfortunately collapsed, uh, this is the rear of the Midlands. These are other radio telescopes that are working radio telescopes, and, uh, and they're detecting fast radio bursts, and they're detecting them in enormous numbers compared to what was possible before. In particular, the, the Chime Telescope in Canada, which kind of looks like a skateboard park, uh, has detected thousands of these signals already. Because it can scan a huge area of sky at any given time. It's like a wide field camera, essentially. And what we've been doing here in the Netherlands, for instance, is we've been using the fact that this, this Chime Telescope in Canada, is, which is basically the world's best machine for finding these fast radio bursts, um, it's very good at finding these signals because it looks at a large area of sky, but it doesn't know where they came from. And we would like to know exactly where on the sky they came from so that we can figure out which galaxy they came from. So we've been taking the signals that Chime detects and then we've been looking at them with a, a radio telescope that's basically spread across the entire planet. We use radio dishes in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in, in the Caribbean, in North America, we connect them together using high-speed internet so that they can act together as like really sharp eyes on the sky. And in that way, we can really pinpoint where the radio bursts are coming from on the sky. So one telescope figures out that these sources exist. The other telescope that we use pinpoints where they're coming from, basically. And we've been really successful in this. Um, so this is an example putting this to scale. The, the China telescope, you know, when it detects one of these bursts, it localizes it to an area of sky which is kind of this large compared to the size of the, the full moon. Within that region of sky there are many, many stars, there are many galaxies, and it's kind of not obvious where, which one of those stars or galaxies the, the source might actually be associated with. And we, we need to know this so we know how far away it's coming from them, and so we can figure out what might be producing it. But using these telescopes that are spread across the planet, we can determine these positions very precisely. This is like you know the resolution you would have if say one of your friends uh, you know leaves Leiden tonight they go to New York City and then they they stand in New York City on top of the Empire State Building and they're holding a tennis ball and you look at that and you say oh I can figure out how big the tennis ball is it's kind of like that level of resolution that we're dealing with here so we can zoom in on these sources we can figure out where they are in the sky about a billion times more precisely. We can zoom in over and over again, and we can figure out exactly not only which galaxy they come from, this is the galaxy that this particular source with this telephone number here <laughs> comes from, we can figure out where in the galaxy they come from. And we can figure out with such precision that even the Hubble Space Telescope doesn't have good enough resolution to, to really do justice to how precisely we know where the radio bursts are coming from. So in the future, I know a number of people in Leiden here are working on next generation telescopes, like the extremely large telescope that will have even better resolution. Right now we're kind of limited even by space telescopes like the, the Hubble Space Telescope. But we can zoom in on this galaxy and we can figure out, okay, well this is a region here, a galaxy where stars are forming very rapidly, where there are lots of young stars, and we can place the, the position from which the radio bursts are, are originating and we can figure out, for instance, in this case, that there's a very small offset, but still measurable offset, from between where the radio bursts are coming from and between uh, where the, the starlight is coming from these young stars. And this was quite surprising, because you might think, well, these bursts are coming from something that's really energetic, it must be really, really young, it must be some kind of spectacular source, that maybe it was just born or something like that, like a neutron star that's only 10 days old or a year old or something like that. But surprisingly, what we found is that these sources are offset from the places we think they might be born. So they might be a lot older than we suspected. So they might you know, be able to be energetic and, uh, and interesting even into their old age, which is you know, inspiring for someone like me as well. So you saw this telescope in the, the quiz that we had. This is actually a working telescope here in the Netherlands. This is a LOFAR telescope. This is the so-called Superterre. And I wanted to point out that even these telescopes that we have here in the Netherlands can detect radio bursts from, from fast radio bursts. So this is, uh, this is an artist's conception again, showing this galaxy where a fast radio burst is coming from, showing it uh, washing over the LOFAR radio telescope. And the source that I've been showing you that, uh, that comes from this galaxy, one of the incredible things about it is not only is it offset from this region where we think stars are being born, we also see that the radio bursts have this incredibly uh, regular pattern. 
the source kind of becomes uh, active every 16 days or so, and we also see that um, it becomes active at different radio wavelengths at different times. So the low frontal telescope, which measures really long wavelengths of radio light, so ra radio waves are about as big as this room or so, it detects these radio bursts much later than we see them at shorter wavelengths. And what we think might be going on is we might be coming uh, to the conclusion that the source of very bright radio bursts is originating in a galaxy about half a billion uh, light years away, and that the source is actually a neutron star, similar to the, the types of objects that Anna was talking about, very, very magnetic, so a very strong magnetic field, and that it's orbiting around a very massive star, so a star that's maybe 10 times more massive than our own sun. That star is spewing out lots of gas uh, because, uh, because it has very strong winds and it's creating a whole mess around itself, and the neutron star and its very strong magnetic field are going in and out of the system, and the strong magnetic field is getting pummeled with all of this gas from the other star, almost like you're throwing fuel onto a fire, and that kind of fuel onto a fire, this loose analogy I'm going to use here, this might be what is producing these radio bursts. We might be seeing radio bursts from kind of electromagnetic fireworks that come from a very magnetic neutron star passing through this ionized gas of a massive star that it's orbiting around. So this might be the solution, at least for what's causing these radio bursts from this particular source. And you might say, okay, that's nice. Is this the solution for all of the fast radio bursts that you've been seeing so far? Unfortunately, it is not. <laughs> Unfortunately, the more observations we take, the more we're scratching our heads with this phenomenon. Because very recently, this is a, a, another source of fast radio bursts that we've looked at. It's in the direction of the M81 galaxy, which is this very large galaxy. You can even see it from your backyard if you use uh, binoculars. Here is Jan Oort, who's, uh, of course, a famous uh, professor from Leiden. He's standing in front of this picture of the M81 galaxy. He has no idea that there's a fast radio burst source behind him. <laughs> this is a long time ago, but that's OK. I'm sure he, well, he made lots of other interesting discoveries. Um, and, and the source is really, really nearby because it's, uh, you know, this M81 galaxy is really close to Earth. And quite strikingly, when we figured out where the bursts were coming from, what we figured out was that they're coming from a globular cluster. And for the non-astronomers in the, in, the, in the audience, a globular cluster is kind of like a stellar graveyard. It's where stars go to die, if you will. It contains only very, very old stars, you know, billions of years old. And finding such a, uh, an energetic source in a globular cluster is really, really surprising. It looks very, very different than the source I was telling you about that might be in a binary system. It looks like it's uh, you know, in the stellar graveyard and raises the question, you know, like if we have some of these sources that seem to be uh, in, in binary systems with other stars, uh, you know, relatively young, very highly magnetized, why are we finding some of them in these stellar graveyards? It really suggests that maybe we are still pretty far away from solving this puzzle, but there might actually be multiple different ways for making fast radio bursts, because we're finding them in very, very different locations. Whenever we can localize them to exactly where they are, we don't find them in necessarily the same type of environment. I'm going to skip this one slide. It's basically just talking about something a little bit more esoteric, the fact that we can actually see these sources flickering on very, very short timescales, even nanoseconds or so. And uh, I'm just going to leave you with this, this last slide. I think this is one of the most interesting areas of astronomy right now because this is really a new phenomenon that uh, has a lot to teach us, I think, about extreme astrophysical phenomena. So really some of the most extreme uh, types of phenomena that we can see in the universe. But at the same time, like I was saying, is going to prove to be a very useful tool for studying parts of the universe that we can't otherwise see. Because again, it's like essentially someone's shining a laser beam through through different parts of the, our galaxy and through intergalactic space. These fast radio bursts, I think they have a very bright future for astronomy because again, they're happening all the time. It's like a, a fireworks display and radio waves happening across the sky. They're really an exceptional probes of, of the material between stars and galaxies. Um, we can figure out where they're coming from with very, very high precision. And one of the most fun things about this field is these radio bursts are cheap in the sense that uh, the amount of energy that they carry can be produced by neutron stars and other types of objects like black holes, so we think there are going to be lots of them. And unfortunately, compared to telescopes like the James Webb Telescope, which cost I think 11 or 12 billion dollars, 
these fast radio burst telescopes, these radio telescopes that I was showing you that have been built in the last five or ten years, these things are relatively cheap. They're only 10 or 20 million euros or so. So if you happen to be independently wealthy, and if you're in the room right now, and if you're interested in investing in this you know, growth area in astronomy, uh, come talk to me during the break. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, someone had money back there. <laughs> Sorry, yes, yeah, not to contribute money for the next uh, telescope, but a question. Oh. Okay. Uh, can the energetics of these events help you uh, figure out what are the causes? And maybe a related question is do we know whether it's uh, all around or beamed emission? Yeah, those are two very good questions. So, first off, the amount of energy that each of the bursts contains suggests to us that. You know, some, some neutron stars, the, the energy that comes out of the neutron star comes uh, due to the fact that it's spinning around, okay, and it's slowing down with time. So you're kind of extracting some of its motion, energy in, in the motion of the neutron star, the kinetic energy. And we know that the bursts are way too bright for that to actually be possible. So we think if it's coming from a neutron star, it has to be something more like a magnetar where the magnetic field is so strong and contains so much energy that as the magnetic field is decaying and becoming less strong, that that is a way of tapping energy for the radio burst. So that's, that's one of the arguments that one can make. And then your second question was about... Is it beamed? Is it beamed, yeah. We think it's very likely that the signals are also beamed as well. So um, if you know a little bit about uh, what that would mean, it suggests that maybe the bursts are not quite as bright as what I showed you there. They could be you know, a factor of 10 or 100 times less bright, but the, the more you play that game, the smaller the beams need to be, the more sources you need on the sky to explain why you see so many bursts. So you can only play that game so far without ending up in this situation while the, the bursts are, say, a thousand times less bright than we thought they were because they're really these very narrow beams on the sky, but then you need a thousand times more sources on the sky to explain the number of bursts that we see. Yeah. Does it give any indication about dark matter? Does it give, yeah, so questions about dark matter. So there are some very exotic models. Um, I'm a very conservative person, as I'm sure you know already. Um, some, of the, some of the models that are out there are quite exotic. There are models that suggest, for instance, that um, fast radio bursts could originate due to axion dark matter at the cores of neutron stars. Don't ask me how that works. Um, there are models that suggest that fast radio bursts could come from dark matter annihilation as well. So there are some models that suggest that this could be a signature of dark matter. Well, so being able to show it up. I mean, you're Sorry? saying it's a very useful tool to look at what's between us. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. So it's a very useful tool for looking at ionized so-called baryonic matter, so normal matter. We don't expect dark matter to have any influence on the properties of the radio waves. So we can see how the radio waves are delayed or distorted in other ways, but that's due to ionized material like ionized hydrogen and helium, but it's not due to dark matter. Although, actually, so I do tell a lie, one of the most exciting things that we can potentially do is look at fast radio burst sources that are passing through very deep gravitational wells, and that could be due to dark matter gravitational well. And you could actually see lensing of the radio waves. You could see that, you know, if you've ever seen an Einstein ring, for instance, a gravitational lens of a, a galaxy, if we can see that for uh, fast radio bursts, which will not be easy to do because you need you know, the perfect geometric configuration for this to happen. If you were to able to see that, then you would actually be able to measure the expansion of the universe in real time as well, because these very short duration signals provide a new way of using gravitational lensing to, to measure the expansion of the universe. Maybe I'm the, the question about the yeah. how, how many times do these uh, sources flash? Uh, is it once in a lifetime, or is it every second? Or? Yeah, that's a great question. So some sources are very, very active, and there's a source that about a month and a half ago suddenly started uh, bursting. We'd never seen it before with any of our telescopes, and now it's bursting so often that even with a 
10, 10 meter wide radio telescope. So a telescope that's about the size of this room, which for a radio telescope is tiny, is like a little kindergarten radio telescope. You can still detect radio bursts from this source. Um, so some sources are incredibly active and they're making bursts like every few minutes or so for some period of time. And there are other sources that we've looked at for like a thousand hours or a few thousand hours when we've only ever seen one burst. And there's a huge debate in the community about whether these are coming from the same type of object. Are, some, are these all the same type of thing? Some of them are just hyperactive and some of them are really slow. You know, some of them like, you know, spastic little toddlers and some of them are, you know, pensioners or something like that. Or, or are they genuinely, you know, different things and their activity rate is, is giving us a clue about them being different in nature. I see one last question. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I think radio astronomy is like 70 years old, uh, right? How That's, long yeah. It took us so long to <laughs> Well. We're not as smart as our colleagues. <laughs> it takes us longer to figure things out. Yeah, it's, um, this is a great question because I think it really underlines how little we know about the universe still. Um, the reason we have not found these before is a radio telescope, uh, a typical radio telescope can see a fraction of a percent of the sky at any given time. So I said there's you know, one every 10 seconds, but that's one every 10 seconds somewhere over the entire you know, sphere of the sky. So they're still rare in that sense. And then you also need to record the data at a millisecond or better time resolution, which is a huge data rate. A lot of our, our, our data sets, we're, we're collecting, say, 10 terabytes of data every hour. And then you need to process those data. So I think modern computing coupled with radio telescopes that we could have built decades ago is the reason we're finding them now. We really need supercomputers to find these things, basically. Let's give another round of applause to Jason.